God's love is beyond our understanding. God's love has no way.
God's love is beyond our understanding. God's love has no
God's love is beyond our understanding. God's love has no Well, certainly good evening, everyone, and welcome to All Saints, those who may be visiting us here this evening. We welcome you uh, for this presentation of Building Bridges in a Faith Community, uh, coming out and coming home. We uh, certainly welcome all of those here, but we also welcome those who are watching us on our YouTube Live. Um, we hope that this evening will be uh, a time to, um, you know, break open, uh, you know, the Word and just to be a, a time of of uh, embrace and a time of peace and just a time to uh, open a dialogue uh, for all of God's people. Uh, we welcome uh, everyone here. We also uh, certainly welcome uh, Stan J.R. Uh, Zerkowski from the Diocese of Lexington, who will be our presenter here this evening. And uh, I guess um, I should say Vitami, it's Polish, uh, a welcome uh, to you. So Stan, we, uh, JR, we welcome you to our faith community here, and we look forward to, uh, you know, what you will present and what you will have to say uh, with all of us here this evening. And if we could just rise, and we're going to uh, begin with our gathering song. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us take a moment now to give thanks to God, to praise God for all of creation.
I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made, wonderfully made. I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made, wonderfully made. O Lord, you search me and you know me. You yourself know my resting and rising. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark when I walk or lie down. You know all my ways through and through. I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made, wonderfully made. For you it was who formed my inmost being, knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you who wonderfully made me. How wonderful are your works, which my soul knows well. I praise you, O Lord, for I am wonderfully made, wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being fashioned in secret. You molded me in the depths of earth. I praise you. Oh Lord, for I am wonderfully made, wonderfully made. Let us pray. Ever loving God, you are love beyond all telling and beyond our understanding. You have wonderfully made each of us and you know us well. We are all your people. We belong to you. May your compassionate love and welcome flow through us this evening as we gather in your name. Keep us mindful of your presence in every person. Move us to open our hearts to all those whose voices go unheard, whose presence is ignored, and all who long for human dignity. Give us courage to see with your eyes, to serve with your hands, and to love with your heart. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Good evening, everyone. I didn't always think I was so wonderfully made. Um, it is not a shameless plug for my book, which is in the back, but for most of my life, 
I didn't think I was so wonderfully made. As a matter of fact, I thought I was not so wonderfully made. So it's refreshing to sit here among the people of God and to be able to sing those words, I praise you, O Lord, because I am wonderfully made. That really struck me. We don't usually sing that, uh, that particular psalm, even though I reference that psalm an awful lot in my travels. But as I was sitting there, that really touched me deeply, that I was able to do that in the midst of God's people in God's own house. I could praise God with who I am as who I am and know that I am made in God's image wonderfully. Would that everybody would feel that way, huh? So here's the way this will work this evening. I will talk for an hour or so, and I will stop a few times. And when I stop, I will ask you, get it? And if you get it, you would probably like to respond to me, got it. So let's try that. Get it? Now, if you don't answer me, I'll get it. And this talk could go on for most of the night until you get it. So get it? Got it, yeah. Exactly. Here's a conversation I often have with bishops and parents and leaders of the Catholic community. Someone will always cite the catechism, those infamous words, and remind me that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered, and that the inclination is objectively disordered. That might seem like a lot right out the gate, but that's the elephant in the room. I'd like to remind them that masturbation is also called intrinsically disordered in the catechism, as is contraception as is not sharing with those in need proportionately to our blessings. And I asked them, would you ever dream of approaching conversations with anyone with the reminder that masturbation is intrinsically disordered and assume they would engage with you in a conversation? Would they ever look at a married couple and constantly think, hmm, they're married, they're probably having sexual relations, and I don't see a dozen kids. They must be doing something intrinsically disordered, and they must be objectively disordered. Would we ever walk around wondering who is masturbating or who is using contraception? Would we police the condom aisle in the store or spy on the pharmacist and what he's doling out? to see who's filling their birth control prescription. Of course not. That would all be insane. That would be crazy. If we approached life like that, we'd need therapy. Get it? Good. So why do we approach life that way with our LGBTQ siblings? that flies in the face of the catechism's direct admonition. Every sign of unjust discrimination, the catechism says, in their regard, should be avoided. Did you know the catechism said that? And so, how do we foster attitudes and help develop consciences that understand the catechism as it's meant, and make sure that in the body of Christ, every sign of unjust discrimination is avoided. Better yet, banished. Every sign of unjust discrimination against anyone, ever. Catholic parents, families, friends, and allies are called to what? The great commandments, to love one another, to protect the baptismal dignity of every son or daughter that they have in God, 
to remember the admonition given to parents and godparents at baptism that this candle so, so brilliantly portrays for us. Keep this light of faith burning until this child is called back to God. And yet, so often, the light of faith is snuffed out. And the candle becomes a meaningless sign. If we're pro-life, and if we claim to respect life, and if we're good Catholics, well, then we have to respect all life. Correct? We have to respect all life. From conception until natural death. All life. Get it? Good. Now, we can't and do not respect life if we denigrate a life and cause it so much pain and judgmentally reject it so that life, that child of God, feels alienated, shunned, and so worthless, they seek to end their painful living. I'm here to tell you that I see this all around the country. Parents tell me this, that they've lost their children. Why have they lost their children? Because the church told them that their child was no good. The kids heard it. I've gone to too many high schools, was telling Father Walt. I've gone to too many high schools where they've called me in to speak to them, to work, to work some sort of damage control after a young life was laying in a casket in a gym because a young person was bullied for being who they were, and they couldn't take it any longer, and they took their own lives. I've seen too many young people in high schools with marks from cutting. Those are the wounds of Jesus I see on those young people. Shame on us. Shame on a church that does that. And we have to take responsibility for doing that. We do that with attitudes. We do that with that stuff I talked about in the beginning, where we look at people and reduce them to something that's in our heads that we probably shouldn't even be thinking about. Yesterday in Pittsburgh, I was there uh, by chance overnight. I was there because the uh, one piece of luggage that I had with the books and all the materials and so forth was lost. And they said to me, uh, I won't mention the airlines, but they're notorious for this. Uh, they said, uh, we will deliver that to you, Mr. Zukowski. We'll deliver it to your hotel uh, before midnight or before morning. And I said, well, I'm going over to All Saints Parish. And I told them where it was in Bridgeport. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't deliver that far. You'd, you'd have to come back tomorrow and go get it. And I thought, well, I'm not going to drive two hours and drive two hours to get this thing and go through that airport mess. Um, so I took a hotel. Um, and I went out to eat last night by myself, and I sat in this booth. And um, there came a family. I think it was a family, a whole family. And a grandmother, too. And they were going off uh, into the booth behind me, sort of. And I noticed on one of the, uh, one of the young people's shirts, it said, uh, trans rights are human rights. And I must have taken a double take, like I was sitting this way in the booth. I must have looked at it that way and sort of like smiled or something. My face must have revealed something because grandma comes up to me. And she comes up to the booth and she says, that's right. She says, and I stand for that. And she went on and on about it. At any rate, I'll spare you all of that, because this will go on for three hours, and you will have gotten it, and I'll still go on for three hours. So um, I had a chance meeting with a guy called Mike, who was part of that clan, and then came and sat with me in the booth. Because I did say that I, I have to tell you this part, because I did say to them that the T-shirt caught my eye, told Grandma caught my eye, because I am the uh, facilitator of the Diocese of Lexington, LGBT Outreach, I'm the director of LGBT Outreach at, at a big parish for Lexington, and I do a national ministry as well. So I got all that out, so Grandma knew that I wasn't just loony, you know, that I wasn't just looking at their uh, 
granddaughter or whatever. And so anyway, Mike comes over and he says, could I, would you answer a question? And I said, of course. He said, how can you be so sure that you're right? That it's okay with God that I'm gay. I never in my wildest imagining thought I would have that kind of a conversation in the Hofbrau house in Pittsburgh when I was really trying to mind my own business. His question reminded me of just how effectively abusive and debilitating fear-based religion and his brand of Catholicism especially sometimes is. Turns out he's a 30-ish year old young man who recently came out to his very Catholic family. Our conversation included a discussion about the pain and struggle of religious and spiritual deconstruction, as well as the devastation of familial rejection, which is far too prevalent. All of this was, of course, familiar to me. I've had that same conversation with many people. And for each of them, though they do find some comfort in their fellowship of common suffering, the pain is not diminished because of the large number who endure it. It's just as raw and biting for every one of them as it is for the next. It was just as raw and biting for Mike, who sat down with a complete stranger, me, yesterday, to have this discussion. Told your pastor, maybe... You know, this is how God works sometimes. I find out, probably most times, it just takes me a while to find out and to figure it out. But I wasn't supposed to be here in Bridgeport last night. I was supposed to be in Pittsburgh. I was supposed to be eating at that Hofbrau house. I was supposed to take a look at that young woman's T-shirt and make some sort of a face that allowed that grandmother to speak to me, that allowed Mike to come over to my table and talk to me. Is it all coincidence? No, it's not coincidence. It's God... It's God giving us what the saints called consolations. You're doing what I'm asking you to do. Here's a consolation. That's how I look at it. That's what my spiritual director would tell me. I'd say, what more do you need? But that pain is, is raw and biting for every one of them, every one of those that speak. I left the conversation strongly reaffirmed in my conviction that the pursuit of grace and welcome and celebrating their lives for LGBTQ siblings is a vital piece of the church's mission. We're not simply trying to help people view gay, lesbian, bi, or trans persons differently. We're trying to help them see sexuality and gender differently and humanity differently and God differently. All of this is part of the growth of the human soul, the maturing that must happen if we're living in God. Incarnational theology, you can call it. Probably nothing more than that. Get it? Good. As Catholics, our faith is based on divine revelation, which we believe is perfected in Jesus, the word of God whom we meet in the Gospels, word and sacrament. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says the entire law of the gospel is contained in the new commandment of Jesus. The entire law of the gospel is contained in the new commandment of Jesus to love one another as Jesus loved us. The entire law of the gospel. We're called above all else to respect and to love then every person. But too often LGBTQ people and their families are discriminated against and they're rejected in faith communities. Let me tell you. And what's the impact of that? The suicide rate among the LGBT community is significantly higher than the rest of the population. Do you know how much higher it is? 40% higher. That should make you gasp. And the percentage of homeless youth who are LGBTQ, kids that are thrown out of their houses for being queer, for being gay, for being bi, for being trans, especially trans, has grown to around 40% of the homeless youth population. Now, that's significant because they only represent 7% of the whole youth population. 
population. That's huge, folks. That's huge. There's an overriding pro-life issue here that needs to take precedence when we consider how we should respond and minister to LGBTQ people whose lives are devalued and threatened in so many ways. Some will say that they respect and they love LGBTQ people. Oh, we love them. But we think they're disordered or confused and that they need help to change their ways, whatever their ways mean. Let's go back to the beginning when I said, would we ever approach any group of people with those silly questions, those offensive questions, those ugly questions, those nosy questions, those presumptuous questions, those biased questions? Would we ever? Never. And yet we do with this population regularly. As well-intentioned as that may be, that's not accompaniment. That's a misinformed, judgmental approach, not based on the reality of being LGBTQ. Approaching an LGBTQ person as someone who's confused or needs to be fixed, especially a young person, is damaging. Conversion therapy is damaging. It's wrong. I think it's disingenuous to say that we, the church, oppose a bill because of problematic language without offering specific language that could correct it. Behavior can and sometimes should be changed, make no mistake. But orientation does not need to be changed. A person's orientation is their gift from God. That could be made clear, that a person's orientation is a gift from God. It's problematic at best, I submit, and sinful maybe at worse, to try to use therapy to change one's sexual orientation, especially when it's imposed on the person by others. I think what we need is a conversion of hearts. Heck, we all need conversion therapy. Every one of us, that's why we come here. That's why we have the sacrament of reconciliation. That's why we have spiritual direction. That's why we listen to the word. That's why we have community. Conversion. Each of us, every single day, to have a heart like Jesus' heart. To love like Jesus loves. So what is the reality of LGBTQ persons then? What is their reality? The only way that we're ever going to figure that out is by listening to them. About two weeks ago, I had the mother of an 18-year-old who had just come out as transgender asking me if she affirmed her daughter, would she be guilty of leading her daughter into sin? I told her to go speak with her pastor told her to go get a spiritual director, told her to bring it up perhaps in the Sacrament of Reconciliation if she didn't want to have that conversation outside the internal forum. I told her what I thought, told her that when there is no choice, when there is no act of the free will, then an action can't be sinful. I think and there's some priests here who can correct me. I think that's basic moral theology. The LGBT can't be inherently sinful if the individual has no choice in the matter. So telling people that they're sinful just by virtue of who they are, mm -mm. Mm -mm. and we've got to listen to them. We've got to create safe spaces to hear their stories. And then you know what? We've got to believe their stories. That's their reality. We've got to listen to them. When they share, we have to believe them. So how can we be more welcoming and accepting in our pastoral ministry? I'll tell you one thing that I've learned. and I've learned this by listening for the last eight years all around this country. One assumption among LGBT people is that generally churches 
and venues for Catholic education, schools, religious ed classes, adult formation, are not safe places for them. The church doesn't have to have a sign on the door that says LGBTQ people are not welcome. The assumption is they're not welcome. So that's the starting point. So if we want to be known as welcoming, there needs to be some proactive signs of that welcome. Being neutral is not enough. You know, I get a lot of a lot of places that say, well, JR, you know, we're a welcoming parish. We welcome everybody. Everybody's welcome here. And we sing that beautiful song, all are welcome. And that might be true. And everybody that comes to that parish knows that. But do they know that way far beyond the people that are coming to that parish? How about the people that are feeling alienated, the people that are feeling shunned, people that were told 30 years ago, don't bother coming to church anymore because the church doesn't want you because you're gay or lesbian. What about those people? Where are they? How do they know that we're sitting in here singing all are welcome and that the church will welcome you, will give you a seat at the table, will embrace you just as you are perfectly and wonderfully made? Let's start by honestly looking at our own attitudes and prejudices. What do we really think about LGBTQ people? That's a starting point. Do we ever mention LGBTQ persons, or those little letters, when we give a talk, or a sermon, or teach a class? Do we ever use those words, those little letters that they like to be called, that we like to be called, in a positive light? Is there literature that supports and encourages LGBT persons to be their authentic selves available in our parishes, in our churches, in our vestibule? Is this a safe place for them? If it is, why? You tell me, why is it a safe place for them? We'll get to that maybe. You know, about seven years ago, when I was starting two support groups at Lexington Catholic High School, St. Paul's Parish that I'm at, downtown Lexington, we began praying every Sunday a specific intention. And we coupled it with other marginalized groups, perhaps for refugees and immigrants, for all on the margins, for those who feel abandoned by the church, for those who feel unwelcome, especially our LGBTQ community, which feel very unwelcome. I know that in Lexington. I know that all over the country, in many places, outside of a few pockets where they do feel welcome in some particular parishes. I had high school students come up to me that would, hadn't been to church, refused to go to church. And they would come with their parents to St. Paul's because we were praying by name for LGBTQ plus persons. And those kids would be in tears that this is the first time that I felt the church recognized I exist, let alone prayed for me, so touched with. I could tell you who they are and their parents as well. If you do a little Google search, you'll see very clearly, do, do a Google search on Zerkowski, that's me, and do Rainbow Banner if you want some exciting reading for the night. You will see that I am either a saint or I am an agent of the devil himself. It depends whether, what you're reading. Because we put a Rainbow Banner in front of St. Paul Church many years ago, and it said, LGBTQ plus Catholics, family, friends, all are welcome here. I didn't think that was so bad. Um, we have a grade school, the, the regional school. Ten parishes feed into it. The morning after we put that banner out the first time, two young girls and their mothers, I think it was a fifth grader, and I was an eighth grader, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the book, shameless plug. They came and they rang the uh, office door bell, Monte Clement. And I thought, oh, Lordy, here we go. We're going to get it. 
We're going to get up a good for that banner. These parents are hacked off. Their kids are seeing that on the way into school. It's going to be ugly. Wrong. They were in tears. Both of those little girls were in tears. You know why? For some reason, they identified as, as gay. And they cried as their mothers took them in front of the church toward the parking lot because they saw that. And they couldn't believe that their Catholic church saw them. That taught us something about that banner. Now, we baptize the kids of parents who aren't married. We're doing marriage prep with young people who are already living together. We're giving communion to parishioners who we know only show up for Sunday Mass when they don't have a tea time or they don't have a ball game. And we're performing Catholic funeral services for people who haven't been to church in years. Thank God we're meeting people where they're at. Thank God we're doing those things. We're meeting them right where they are on their journeys through life, just as Jesus did. But can we do the same thing for LGBTQ persons? Can we do that same thing? We often hear from parents of LGBT children across the country who are struggling in their feelings with parishes and with Catholic schools, who in some cases are literally rejecting outright their LGBT children. We read about those kind of places. We're okay with non-Catholic students attending Catholic schools, and we should be. But a Catholic gay or a transgender student, all of a sudden we get hysterical. What's our position? In ministry, we can do good or we can do lasting damage. Hopefully we're saying that from what I just said. In ministry, all of our ministry, the ministry of the baptized and the ordained, we can do good or we can do lasting damage. Get it? Good. So you might be saying, well, J.R., well, then how do you suggest we navigate our youth struggling with their sexuality? First of all, I say name them. Jesus called people by name. I assume, I don't, I don't know you two gentlemen, but I assume because you're wearing like cassocks perhaps, and one of you wearing a cassock anyway, okay, and a collar, a Roman collar, that you're probably priests? Okay, cool. So that's good. So I, that's, that, that's real good. So, I assume you like to be called Father? And I should call you Father. Correct. Gotcha. And that's good. And I wouldn't think of not calling you Father. If I saw you on the street, I'd call you Father just because of what you're wearing. Because that's my tradition, and, and I would afford you that respect because I know you want to be called Father, and you should be called Father. If our LGBT people tell us what they want to be called, what's the harm in calling them that? You know, I think of the nuns that taught me when I was in grade school, and all of them had men's names. And nobody batted an eyelash. And we should have said, what's wrong with you, honey? <laughs> Why are we calling you Sister Luke? Why are we calling you Sister Mary John? I mean, I'm being ridiculous here. But respect caused me to call the good sisters that taught me by the names that they preferred to use. And they preferred to use male saints' names. And, and I'm still good. I'm pretty good because of it, I think. Those nuns were good women. And it didn't kill me to call them by a man's name with the word sister in front of that man's name. But it seems pretty odd, doesn't it? So LGBT could be odd. That may not roll off our lips. And you know what? They may add another letter to it and confuse me, so I have to rewrite every talk, I have to rewrite every book. And, and this is evolving constantly. I don't know if it's LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQIA, LGBT+. So sometimes I just say LGBT. And you have to assume my, you know, that, that, I'm, that I'm being kind to everyone. But name, name them. Call them what they want to be called. It doesn't hurt. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. Create spaces and times to listen to them. That's so important. That is so important to listen to them. 
hear their stories, affirm the reality of their stories. That's their reality. It's not a political agenda. I promise you it's not. It's people suffering. It's people telling you what their via crucis is, what their story of death and hopeful resurrection might be. Listen to their stories. Honor their stories. Tell them they're good. They're wonderfully made by God just as they are. Don't presume they're doing dirty, nasty stuff. That's an affront to their dignity to presume that. Now, I get it. I really get it. Because you watch the news, and like, for example, during Pride Month. During Pride Month in Lexington, we are at every Pride Festival. There are Catholic booths. There are these Pride Festivals around the country. There are Catholics at all of them. Sisters, priests, deacons, lay faithful women, men, LGBTQ, lay faithful, and, you know, staffing these booths at Pride Festivals. And there are hugs, and there are moments of conversion. I'm talking about the good kind of conversion. We're converted to love, or we're converted to have a heart like Christ, or we're converted to, to recognizing our baptismal dignity and living it. And yet, during Pride Month, we don't see that. We see, oftentimes, the eye-opening stuff that, that, uh, that makes us all cringe, that makes me cringe, on TV. You know, we see somebody walking down Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue in New York in a jock strap. And picture me doing that, will you? Uh-uh. Picture most LGBTQ persons doing that kind of stuff. Uh-uh. They just want, they want to live. They want to go to school. They want to be a member of a community. And they want us to hear their stories and to honor their stories like we honor everybody else's story. So we're telling our kids, especially our youth, that they're good, perfectly made just the way God made them. How are their parents going to feel about this? Catholic teaching about the dignity of the person is fundamental to our faith tradition, isn't it? Sure is. Couple that with science. And you probably can pro, uh, preclude sin, meaning that one cannot sin by being who God created them to be. To be. To, now, we can all act out and do sinful things. I'm not saying that we don't. Everybody does. Everybody in this room does. Me too. And that's when we need that conversion. We need to, to be called back to our baptismal dignity and say, hey, this is probably not what you should be doing. But you're perfectly made. And your story is a good story. It's a gospel that you're writing. I don't know. Maybe Moral Theology 101 is called for in every parish, every high school, every, every place that we get together. Do we encourage days of discernment or opportunities for guest speakers to talk about these things like you have with me tonight? Not everybody's going to agree with everything I say. And actually, everything I say is not everything that I can say because we could be here for two months dissecting every word that, I am, that I'm speaking tonight. I wish I could live among you and you could live with me and, and we, could, we could dissect it all and move together as a community in dialogue, but we can't and I have to say some things and people are gonna take it out of context and, and some people aren't and some people are applauding and thinking I'm saying something I'm not saying and some people are thinking that I'm saying things that I am not saying. So an, an hour is not gonna cut it, but it's gonna scratch the surface, I hope, for, for more robust discussions. I think the big question, though, that we can have and should have is how do we mitigate things like suicide, cutting, and other harmful behaviors? By affirming the person over and over and over. The negative messaging is constant. The church also provides a lot of reasons to support. Start with the catechism. Go to Catholic social teaching. Pope Francis has offered so much in his writings. Read them, use them. How do we help young people especially or any LGBTQ persons that want to come to our community or look to our community or beyond our community to come home to this table? By affirming them, calling them by name, calling them what they want. You want to be called gay, you're gay. You want to be called lesbian, fine, you're lesbian. You want to be called trans, you're trans. You want to be called queer, you're queer. If you're a lady and you want to be called Sister John, I'm going to call you Sister John. 
use the language they use to refer to themselves. These guys could be my sons. I call them father. <laughs> the language they refer to themselves. And I got enough respect to use it. Pastoral leaders. Can you put your pronouns on your emails? Or maybe even your desk? Why? It's a sign of openness, a sign of welcome, a sign of I'm ready to listen to your story. My pronouns fit who I am. He and him. Now, let's say somebody dropped sister's name sister from, from their, from their uh, little thing at the bottom of the email. And like some sisters do nowadays, they just put their first name, last name, in the religious order uh, symbol. Like I think of my dear friend, Sister Louisa. She writes Louisa, comma, O-P. So putting our pronouns on an email could be helpful if it were Sister John. <laughs> so it would be John, comma, O-P, she, her. So I know that that John is a she and a her, not a him, and not a Dominican man, but a Dominican woman. For the LGBT community, it's a sign of openness because some people feel that they are trapped in a body that betrays who they feel they are. The kid that I was dealing with someplace else in this country was bullied terribly to the point almost of death. They called me in to see what could be done with the administration of this Catholic high school. And this kid wanted to use pronouns she and her, because this young man felt that he was just so trapped in the body and the trappings of a male body, but didn't feel like a boy, didn't feel like a male. I'll never understand that for the life of me. I will never understand that. I feel like what I look like. Some people don't. That's just the reality of it. That's their story. That's what they're telling us. Can we just honor that? Can we go with it? Can we accompany them? and say, you know what, I believe you, I'm going to come. Or do we right away have to try to change somebody and say, no, you're wrong? Well, they're not wrong. This is what the kids tell me. So I get a choice. Either accompany this kid and listen to this kid and accept his version of reality. This kid's going to end up here in the aisle in a box going down. Which one do we want to do? We pro-life, we respect life or not? Sometimes the rubber meets the road in a very difficult fashion. That's a very difficult Fashion right there. I think we can name our biases and prejudices. Be honest. Be honest. Especially with whoever is your support network. Name your fears. We all have them. What fears do we have about LGBTQ people? Sometimes in these high schools when I go, some of the, some of the boys will say, well, I'm afraid of the I'm afraid of the gay guys. I'm afraid they're looking at me. I'm afraid of, you know, they might want to try something with me. I'm here to tell you that is the last thing that most LGBTQ kids are thinking about in high school. The hookup culture might be alive and well and good in the straight community in our high schools. Not so alive, well, and good in the LGBTQ community. You know why? Think about it. A kid that's gay, a boy that's gay, sophomore, freshman, whatever. First of all, he's got issues with coming out. He's got issues with coming out. That's scary enough. Coming to terms with one's own identity is scary enough, frightening enough, let alone the reaction of others around you. In some places, it's cool to be gay. In other places, not so cool. And they'll beat the daylights out of you. So take that to what the straight kids do with, their, with, with the hookup culture and figure out, do you think that kid is going to try to act out on his sexuality with another male? He's too scared to, number one. There's no morality even involved here. He's not even thinking about, is it moral or is it right or should I be chaste or celibate or, or whatever. It's simply, I'm too scared to act out on this part of my sexuality. 
But I'm here to tell you that it's unfair to look at our youth who are gay, who are bi, who are trans, and be pinning this stuff on them. It's vastly unfair. So if you got that fear, or we have that fear, man, put it into perspective. Get some reality based in that fear, or mixed in that fear. Pray out loud for LGBT persons at Eucharist. See what happens then. See what happens then. That's when you will see miracles of conversion happen. What do I mean by that? I mean, you will then see people weeping. You'll see young people crying. You'll see people returning to the church where we can restore their baptismal dignity because they hear that we are praying for them by name. Never condone any type of negative rhetoric. How about using uh, non-binary relational terms every so often? Maybe instead of brothers and sisters, try siblings or my family members, or my dear people of God. You say, what about this non-binary stuff? Like, this could be an entire two-week course. I'm not going to get into it big time. Let's say this, though. In Native American culture, there have always been, read about it. In the Native American culture, there have always been people who were revered for having dual spirits, they call. Is there any shock that maybe now people are talking about that? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I've got to believe it as I hear it. I've got to honor the story. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before us. Remember that beautiful reading from, from uh, Palm Sunday, I believe, right? Who would believe what we have heard? Can anything good come from Nazareth? He claimed to be the Son of God. It's all insanity, isn't it? Wow. Apply that to Jesus in our midst today. we got some good old scripture going on, don't we? Learn what science is saying. Church hasn't had a good track record with science. Poor Galileo. Say no more. Provide opportunities for the entire parish and the wider community to hear what the science is saying. My pastor is a scientist at St. Paul. Teaches me a lot about what the science is saying about the human person. These are all tough conversations. I have them all over the country. But I tell you what, honesty is the best policy. Provide people with safe spaces to express their concerns. But don't back down from doing what is right and just according to Catholic teaching. Admit that the language is unfortunate right now. I believe, I truly believe that intrinsically disordered will be changed. John Paul changed the catechism, others have changed the catechism. Be honest, integrity goes a long way. So when someone comes back to church and we brought them back to the family of God, and they're here in our midst, let's not lie to them. Let's tell them the truth. You'll hear things you won't like, but walk with us on this journey of change. Walk with us. We'll accompany one another. Your story and your part in this work is important. Say that to them. Be honest with them. And don't begin or let anyone else begin with presuming sin. Remember how I started this talk. We would have an empty church. We would insult each other. We would be grotesquely wrong to be having those conversations with one another, presuming sin. I know that very well. Let me, let me tell you about something that's happening in my life right now. And Sean, if you're listening, hello, wherever you are. So um, when I was 30, I had cancer, okay? 
Now, I am a 60-year-old gay man. I know I don't look 60, but I am. Get it? <laughs> OK, good. So at any rate, uh, I'd gone into, you'll read this in the book, but I'll give it away. Uh, I went into the store for the last eight years, this place of business, and there was a young man working behind the counter. Very polite to me. Uh, could tell he was a hard worker, was decent. That's where it began and where it ended. One day I go in. He's not in there. I ask the boss, what happened? And he hadn't been in there for a while. I wonder what happened. Was, did Sean move? Did Sean quit? What happened? Just curious. You know, kind of curious things you might ask somebody in a, in a town. So, no, Sean's in the hospital. What's the matter with Sean? Huh? He's been in for a couple of weeks. Well, do me a favor. Tell Sean that JR said if you need anything, let me know. Sean's 30, OK? When I was 30, I had cancer. I had cancer three times. But when I was 30, I had cancer. And that was the bad cancer. And when they were wheeling me into surgery, as a matter of fact, they told my mother that there was no hope that I was going to uh, make it through this cancer. My mother went down and fainted. And I understand exactly what it's like to live in fear with a terrible disease. So at any rate, I hear Sean's in the hospital with a terrible disease, ulcerative colitis that is progressive, and it's never going to get better. Hospital, 14 days during COVID, OK? Bad time to be in the hospital, your own room. I reached out to Sean. I was uh, uh, on, a, on a retreat at St. Minor at Arch Abbey, in, Arch Abbey in, uh, in Indiana, where I, where I went to school. And I went there for quiet and for peace, to not be disturbed, to spend time with God. I spent that entire week on my phone with Sean. He was in his private retreat in his hospital room. I was in my private retreat in a cell at the Arch Abbey. And God had different plans for how I was going to retreat that week. During that week, I got to know Sean very, very well. Because we, I had a lot of time. Normally, I don't have the luxury of that much time. Sean had nothing but time. He was scared. I understood what it was like to be scared. I understood what it was like to be going through a chronic disease, being afraid you're going to die, all those kind of things. We, be, we became very close to one another. I dare say I love Sean. People look at us now, you know what they think? Sugar daddy. That's what they think. You know what they think about Sean? Gold digger. Isn't that just dang unfair? This is what I mean about when we, when we pin stuff on people. We can't even love another person in a beautiful, wonderful human way without people looking and judging and letting their own biases and letting their own, I don't even know what, fantasies come into play. Sean's no more a gold digger than you are. I don't think you're a gold digger. Sean's no more a sugar daddy than Walt. Walt's a pastor, a lover. And that's what I mean about getting a taste of biases and assumptions. It's hurtful. It's not going to stop me. I don't care who calls me a sugar daddy, and I don't care who thinks he's a gold digger. I'm going to prove them wrong. He's on the back of the cover of my book. Go look. Sean's story is the last story. I wasn't going to tell that story in the book. The book was done. And my editor said, you've got to tell this story. It is the capstone story of everything that you've written. Write it down. So if you're curious about what, what Sugar Daddy and Gold Digger look like, we're on the back cover. Go get yourself a book. He's going to kill me if he's watching this thing. Anyway, provide people with safe spaces to express their concerns, but don't back down from telling the truth. You know, we talk about participating in the synod. Pope Francis said something very interesting about this synod and listening. He said, we've got to make the peripheries the center. That's what he said. Not just we've got to listen to one another. Not just we've got to hear their stories like I've been asking you to do. Pope Francis goes further. He says, we've got to make the peripheries the center. So now we've got our LGBTQ people on the peripheries. We know they're on the peripheries. We know that full well. 
How do we make them the center of our communities? Not just listen to them, not just hear them. We've got to make them the center. We always put out the fire of the house that's burning, don't we? Their houses are burning. Jake was in his freshman year at the University of Kentucky. He saw an ad for LGBT ministry in the pink pages. Golly, the pink pages. That's a little directory that's at straight bars and gay bars and everything else in Lexington that we as Catholic ministry have a, a, an ad in it. It's like an LGBT phone directory, if you will. Jake had attended public high school where he had gone to mass with his family every week. Jake was not from Lexington. In high school, Jake was never out because he feared that he would be ridiculed. He pretended to date young women, but always felt badly because he knew he was being fraudulent with them. Jake had to do what he had to do to survive. Jake went to confession one day, feeling badly that he was gay. He had not had any sexual experience, so he was really only confessing to be gay because he thought that was sinful in itself because he heard that messaging from his parish's leadership. The priest told him in confession that he'd be cured. The priest told him to pray hard. That's how he'd be cured. And that God did not want anyone to be gay. Needless to say, Jake was not cured. Jake researched how to commit suicide effectively on the internet because he said he was afraid of being in pain on the way out. He wanted to be, he wanted to be out. He was afraid of being in pain on the way out. So he wanted to research how he could kill himself and do it quickly and thoroughly. He said he had no hope because he was gay now and it couldn't be prayed away. He didn't have the guts to kill himself the day he set aside to do it, but he said he wished he had the guts at the time. At any rate, he decided not to go to church anymore. He hadn't gone to church since before he left for college. He met other LGBT persons at the University of Kentucky, and they became his friends, and he finally could come out even to himself as a person who did not need to be changed, and he came out to his friends. He happened to pick up the pink pages, soundbar one night, looked through it, and then he saw an ad for Catholic LGBT ministry. He saw Father John Curtis's phone number and my number. Those were the only two ones back in the day. And he decided he didn't want to call a priest because, remember, he was hurt by a priest. So thank God there was somebody without a rev or a sis or on it. And that's the only reason he decided to call me. I didn't have a title. Thank God. He had pretty much given up on the church and on God. Now Jake is at least considering coming to a Catholic church. He doesn't want to kill himself, and he sees himself and understands himself as good and worthwhile. In high school and in church, the effects of homophobia nearly caused Jake to take his life. He had to pretend to be straight to survive. Imagine the living hell Jake lived until he arrived there at the University of Kentucky. Some of you in this room might know exactly what I'm talking about, personally, or because you have a friend or a child that might have gone through the same thing. Mike was a senior in a Catholic high school when we met. I met him at a retreat in Chicago a couple of years back. He was, by everyone's account, a classically good-looking young man. By his own admission, he was an excellent student. The girls found him attractive. Teachers loved his capacity to be engaged with whatever class he was in. His grades were excellent. He was the all-American jock. And every mother's dream for their daughter, except for one problem, Mike was gay. Mike never told anyone, and no one suspected it. Mike said he played the game well. If you play the game well, they don't ask. You don't have to tell. But his homecoming came by vote. Popular guy in high school. That is, until one afternoon, he and another friend got talking, and they got to talking too loudly, and someone overheard it. 
The word spread like wildfire. Mike and his friend were both gay. The all-American jock, the homecoming king, top of the class in academics, the all-around good guy was now, in the twinkling of an eye, subjected to ridicule, to ugliness, and to pain. Uh, homophobia. It isn't always in your face. Sometimes it's subtle, a rumor, gossip, a snide joke. It's subtle, but it's toxic. The cancer that kills the spirit. And it's meant to an awful lot of times. It's meant to kill the spirit. But tragically, too many times it kills the body too. Mike was a strong sort. The friend they overheard him talking to turned out to be his boyfriend. In fact, they both were gay. And they decided to let everyone know it. They refused to keep it a secret. He said he figured everything would be okay. Talk about optimism. Franciscan friars ran that high school. He said they were not only understanding, but they were supportive. And you know what? His experience led to robust discussions in that high school and to change, gospel change. Thank God for the spirit of St. Francis. I'm looking for Kleenex. Is there, is there Kleenex? This is the part where I cry, maybe. Maybe, maybe not, maybe I'm stronger. So it was uh, when I uh, had my cancer. Thank you. That'll do very much. I won't need it now, but thank you. It's a good safety net. <laughs> um, so when I had uh, my cancer, which was bladder cancer, by the way, and it went misdiagnosed for three years in me, and that's why, uh, that's why when they finally got to the point where they decided to diagnose it properly. They said it was so far progressed, according to the films, that there was no hope. But yet when they, and so my mom went down, I told you. But then when they went in, the doctor said, this is some sort of a miracle. That's exactly what he said. The doctor said it was a miracle. Because what they found when they went in to me was what the films looked like three years prior. Not what they looked like the day before when they did the tests. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. All right. So I figured it was just God giving me more time for that personal conversion that I'm always talking about, because Lord knows I need it. But some of the indignities of the testing that goes on for bladder cancer is just gruesome, let me tell you. And maybe some of you gentlemen know some of the things I'm talking about. And it's not pleasant, and it, it's just awful let alone when you're 30. So if you're in a waiting room with somebody else who's going through the same thing, you tend to bond with that person, if nothing else, just because of what you're about to go through. So I bonded with this young man named Billy. And Billy had testicular cancer. And um, Billy and I became very good friends. He was years, about 20 years younger than I was. And... Um, Billy was the uh, church musician, the Blessed Sacrament, in Ocala, uh, uh, Florida. He was about 10 years younger than I was, excuse me. And um, he played the guitar there. And I was doing music ministry at a church uh, in Ormond Beach, Florida, right on the ocean. And if you know anything about Ormond Beach, you know anything about Ocala, you go straight inland, and you got to go, it usually takes a couple hours, because it's only a two-lane road that takes you into Ocala. At any rate, I would take Billy for some of his tests when I got better, and I would accompany him, and I didn't know what he was feeling like. So, I, so now you see I have a history of, of this kind of behavior. Um, so at any rate, I would take him for his tests and so forth. Well, Billy's cancer was not getting better. Okay? And one day, it was just before Holy Week, I took Billy to his doctor, and he was already looking ashen, and he was bald, and um, he, he was not doing real well. I said, well, Billy, would you um, want to go out and get a bite to eat after the tests, you know, when they were over with? I thought maybe it would do him good to go out for a change, to go somewhere. And uh, he didn't want to. 
I know I didn't want to because then people looked at him. You know, people looked at him. So he went home. He said, I'll cook for you. Oh, I thought, oh my God, no. Yeah, he said, cook for me. So they baked chicken, mashed potatoes, green peas, poured me a glass of wine. He had Gatorade in his wine glass because it looked like it, and I didn't look like uh, I was drinking by myself. And, uh, and he had some cookies for dessert. It was on a Thursday. Thursday before Palm Sunday. So now, I'm at a big parish, about 3,000 families, and it's now Saturday before Palm Sunday. That night, that evening, the phone rings, and it's Billy, and he's in the hospital. And he says, can you come here right now? Well, first of all, it's a couple-hour drive. Second of all, it's the vigil of Palm Sunday. And I don't know if there's a pastor. I don't know there's one pastor. I don't know about you guys. But how would you like your church musician to tell you that they're not going to be there on Palm Sunday? And, I mean, we can all have pastoral sensitivity and have hearts of gold, but I think that we would not be real happy with your church musician taken off, even for a noble purpose, right? At least I felt that way. So I was not going to my pastor and having this conversation. So Billy can't do it. Billy starts crying on the phone. I mean crying, and Billy didn't cry. He was not a crier. He's crying on the phone because he figures that his time is coming. For some reason, he was so sick that he thought his time was coming that night. And he is crying because he is terrified that if he dies that night, that God is going to damn him forever for being gay. Now, I know full well that Pat Sheedy, who was a pastor at Holy Trinity in Ocala, never, ever said such a thing to Billy or to anyone else. Billy never came out to anyone. Okay. And I know Pat was not of the vintage to be speaking like that. So I don't know where Billy heard this from. Never got a chance to ask. But he was in tears, crying. And I said, Billy, I said, oh, God, God's not gonna, gonna damn you for being gay. God's going to love you and embrace you and welcome you home, I promise you that. I said, Billy, I said, I'll talk to you tomorrow. You try to have a good night's sleep, okay? Told him I loved him. We hung up the phone. There was no tomorrow. There was never a tomorrow. There will be a tomorrow, though, and I'll talk to Billy again. There will. I believe that. Otherwise, that candle has no meaning. But I tell you this, I had no idea back then that I'd be talking about the things I'm talking about now. Boy, oh boy, if I can stop one person from feeling like Billy felt as he was dying, then I'll know that I've done something good with my life. I could tell you more stories, some sad, others that worked out well. It all depended on the culture of the place. We have a lot of power, really, all of us here. We have the power to make life hell or a taste of heaven for others. For our LGBTQ siblings, the coming out process, and that process can take years, is often pretty difficult and only made worse by attitudes and biases that are unjust, and discriminatory, and ugly. Every day, your choices either support and respect life or destroy the spirit, destroy hope, and can destroy a life. In the back are some buttons. You might have seen them on the way in. And they're little hearts that say Catholic on them. I'll tell you how they came to be. So I did a day of discernment with the faculty and staff and so forth and some permanent deacons and priests and whatnot for, for a Catholic high school, Lexington Catholic High School. It was back in the year 2017. One of the products of this day of discernment was something identifiable that uh, teachers could wear or could use to signify that they were safe people for LGBTQ students in the high school. And so consequently, going through this day of discernment and other, other manners of discussion, they can wear these now on their lanyards. So kids know when they're getting bullied or whatever that somebody is there for them. That's how this began. 
And so they came up with this thing with the rainbow heart, because the heart for the sacred heart of Jesus, the rainbow because the universal sign of the covenant of God, that you being gay is not going to break that covenant with God, that's for sure. And it's also the rainbow symbol that the LGBT community uses. And the word Catholic, obviously, because we are Catholics. Through the years, as these things, thousands of them have been throughout these, this country, I give those out for free, I, I encourage you to take one and to wear it. Sure, wear it to church. Wear it to the grocery store. Wear it wherever you go. Put it on your purse. Subtle. You don't have to be, don't have to be a big old thing and then your face kind of thing. People are going to notice it. People will notice it. And I promise you that you're going to say to me, JR, I embraced the bleeding, wounded Jesus and the person that came up to me when they saw that buck. You will hear stories. I, I, I can give you names of deacons, of priests that wear, that wear these now. And, and people come up to and me and, and lay people, uh, all kinds of people. And people come up to you and say, my grandson, my son, my friend, my daughter, me. And we'll tell you some story because you see the word Catholic with that sign. And then it's up to you to figure out how to minister to that person and how to bring them home. But I promise you it will happen because someone will notice it and they will talk to you and you will have to embrace the bloody face of Jesus and kiss it. That's what those buttons do. I promise you that's what they do. So here's the bottom line with this part. All most people really want is just a place that allows them to be themselves. Get it? Good. So can we create a safe space to allow others to be, to safeguard their dignity, to protect it? I think God expects nothing less. And what are maybe some things that you can do here at All Saints to truly welcome LGBTQ persons? What are some things you can do? What, are, what is one thing you can do that you're not doing already? Maybe two. You know, we live in a tension, but so did Jesus. Laws, rules, traditions, small t. And life's messiness must coexist. It just has to. People are hurt. The church has made a mess sometimes. Maybe we have too. By our thoughts, words, deeds, maybe our lack of thoughts, words, and deeds. There's a reason we do that at the beginning of every Mass, right? We've, met, we've made a mess. Hopefully, though, we're wounded healers trying to reconcile our love for our Catholic faith and the hurt we see, know, and have experienced ourselves or with others in the LGBT community. Silence allows new generations of LGBT children and youth to be subjected to devastating harms. We cannot be silent and we cannot be neutral any longer. Don't be silent. What's the golden rule? You still, still preach it, right? Apply it. Apply it liberally, just like Jesus did, just like God does, like Pope Francis keeps reminding us to do. If we're a field hospital, if we're a church of accompaniment, remember that sexual orientation is an in a part of a person. Communicate that in ways that are gentle, loving, wise, prudent, without bias. And if we remember that, then there'll be no more room for viewing an LGBT person as immoral or perverse or presuming that. That is so offensive. And it flies in the face of the catechism. Every sign of unjust discrimination should be avoided. Why are we picking on them? I'm not looking out here and thinking, oh my God, who's doing what? But we do that with our LGBT people. Now, my goal is not to undermine our, my faith, our faith. My goal is to promote the fundamental core values of my faith, love, compassion, respect, or as the catechism says in reference to homosexual people, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. How do we live respect, compassion, and sensitivity to LGBT persons? 
Here's the story. So I told you about that banner, right? In front of, uh, of St. Paul's. So one day, a guy by the name of Nick crawls up our stairs. I don't know, we got about two dozen of them in front of the church, maybe. So it takes some guts to walk up to our church. It was built in 1865, been in continual use since. So it's beautiful, beautiful historic church, historic St. Paul. And um, he walked in. He was on his way to the Episcopal Cathedral, just a couple of blocks away. But he said he felt something that pulled him back to the Catholic Church that day. He had seen our banner, and he knew what we were doing. But something pulled him in. He came in, and he sat. We have a main aisle, you know, traditional sort of neo-Gothic-looking church, and a side aisle and a side aisle. Very long church, very tall. Um, he sat off to the side, a side aisle, pew, near the back, taking a chance just to come in. He said that somebody greeted him, said, you knew here, and was just so happy to see him, wished that he'd come back and everything else, that he just immediately felt welcome. I don't know if they knew he was gay or he wasn't gay. It wasn't an issue at that point. Here's the issue. He found out that we were just beginning LGBT ministry. You can read about this in the book, but I'll tell you just a little bit about it. I had, I had done this event where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came into St. Paul's Church, and it was an LGBT event. And then I thought, well, we're going to do ministry. We're going to do LGBT ministry. And I get Father John there, and I'm there. And, man, we're going to have that church filled up with this LGBT ministry. Two people showed. Two people. Nick, guy that came, and another guy that wasn't Catholic which is good for evangelization. So at any rate, we, we then decided just to pull up chairs and do this rather intimately. So we're sitting outside. Uh, it was an inglorious beginning, a very inglorious beginning, on four folding chairs in the vestibule outside the ladies' room. This is where all of this began. So from humble beginnings, I don't know what has happened. But at the end of this, we just chatted for a while. At the end of this thing, Nick comes up to me and says, do you think Father John would hear my confession? I haven't been to confession in probably about eight years. Whoa, I thought to myself, good beginning. Of course, Father John, I'd be glad to hear your confession. I take the other guy, Kevin, with me outside. We leave. I say, John, turn off the lights after you get done hearing Nick's confession. I said, because Sister Clara will have a fit. If the lights are left on and make sure the door is done. And he takes care of all of that. I leave with Kevin. And I can tell this story. Nick has given me permission to tell this story. So I'm not telling tales outside of school because it's a wonderful story and it underlines and it underscores everything that I'm talking about here tonight. Nick had been in a marriage to another guy. This other guy that he was in the marriage with had a taste for three ways. And I don't mean like hot dogs at, uh, in Cincinnati. Nick would have to get drunk most nights in order to act out on this behavior. He didn't like it. You know what the first thing we did at LGBT ministry, the very first thing we did? We helped Nick get out of that marriage. We restored Nick's dignity. And we didn't help him get out of a marriage because he was in a gay marriage. We, got, we helped him get out of the marriage. I want to make that clear. We, 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 we got him out of the marriage because the marriage was toxic. It was a toxic, no good relationship that was destroying his dignity as a son of God. Do you understand me? Get it? That's an important point. So we restore Nick's dignity. We get him out of that marriage. His dignity is restored. He doesn't need to drink every single night. He's not feeling used and abused any longer. Nick was elected president of the parish council at St. Paul a number of years later, just a few years back. This May, just a couple of days, in front of our bulletin, it's already there, and I gave him his cards just the other day. He's the associate director of LGBT ministry. He took a chance coming up those stairs. Somebody in that church greeted him, made him feel welcome. So before we say all our welcome, 
we got to make sure our parishioners know that all need to be welcomed by every single one for all ministers of the church. We restored this young man's dignity, and he is a vital member of the community. That's what happens, and that's what we're talking about, restoring dignity. We restore, we restore people's dignity. They don't need to cut themselves. They don't need to die and think that they're going to hell because of who they are. I'm going so long. We should be here for a week. I'll cut this, I promise you. Just bear with me. Let's get to some good stuff. So I think our job is to educate, to pastorally accompany, and not to offend. That makes sense, right? Educate, accompany pastorally, and stop offending people. Calling attention to erroneous or harmful beliefs is not the same as attacking a person's faith. Bottom line, ongoing conversion must take place. Ongoing conversion therapy must occur, not for LGBT people, but for each and every heart, so they can be more like Jesus, and we can all be more like Jesus, and see Jesus, God's own image, in every LGBTQ person. That's what we need to do. Now, we must admit that some of our fellow Catholics disagree with the specific rationale that keeps getting restated by church authorities that any sexual act is contra naturum if it is done outside of marriage between a man and a woman open to conception and is thus intrinsically disordered and mortally sinful. Do you understand what I just said? Do you all understand what I just said? Yes. I must admit that some of our fellow Catholics disagree, disagree with the specific rationale that keeps getting spoken about by church authorities in some places, that any sexual act is contra naturum contrary to nature, if it is done outside of marriage between a man and a woman and open to conception, and thus intrinsically disordered, and thus mortally sinful. We have to be reminded that, in fact, there are other things, such as telling a lie, that are intrinsically disordered. But moralists have figured out ways to get around that rationally, such as mental reservation or for a greater good. In most other human acts, serious sin is distinguished from venial sin. And some acts like killing, are justified by the circumstance, such as self-defense. The same kind of flexible, reasonable judgment should be operative with human sexuality. Unfortunately, all of us who are raised in typical Catholicism have been shaped into a rigid fear if not an abhorrence of sex. Why? There's no good reason. I think it's strictly a prudish fear, which goes all the way back to our Platonic church fathers, who considered the physical body to be inferior to the spiritual world, if not just evil. Maybe we have to let go of that physicalist approach to sexuality and realize that human love is a higher order of reality than simply physical ejaculation. Of course, the act of sex done without love as a husband who might force himself on his wife is not chaste, even if the act is done in the proper position. So then chastity is not 
in the physical act. It's in the will. Chaste love transforms instinctive sexual attraction into care and affection and transforms what looks like animal copulation into a personal intercourse. Yes, we are all called to chastity. Get it? Catholic morality does not force us to agree with every command or prohibition that has ever been issued by the church authority. We all know enough church history to realize that would be insanity. Ethical reasoning is based on experience. Experience leads to insights. Insights come a dime a dozen. Some insights are brighter than others. Insights lead to dialogue and consensus within the community at large, in our case, the church. And granted, there are Catholic fringe groups, like, I'm going to say it out loud, the church militant, who are on a witch hunt about things sexual. Obsessed. Are they authentic Catholics? Are they ethical? Are they possessed by self-indulgence and hatred? You figure it out. Friends, make space and listen to LGBTQ people. They are Jesus speaking to you. Listen to them. Honor their stories. Participate in the work of the synod. Make the peripheries the center. Make LGBTQ persons and all on the peripheries the center of our church, our community, our ministry, the center of our hearts, the center of our love, and the center of Jesus' love. Let them come out and come home just as I have. Get it? Good. Thank you for listening to me, and thank you for coming tonight. So, I am open to questions. I am not open to argument. If anybody wants to argue, I promise you we can have a discussion through Zoom. I'm not adverse to answering questions but, or, or having arguments. I just don't think everybody should be subjected to arguments uh, that doesn't want to be subjected to it. So if something looks argumentative, I'm not going to be rude, but I'm going to ask if we can take it and do it personally. I have a lot to learn. I don't know everything. Uh, we all do. Um, and as I said, I could have done an entire semester's course maybe a month's worth of every night talks on any sentence in this hour. So, uh, you know, have some divine mercy centered my way if I ruffled your feathers. <laughs> In West Virginia, we have a, a huge drug problem, and I just wonder, you mentioned the statistics for suicide in this community. Do you know uh, if, uh, what the statistics are for uh, drug addiction in this community? You know, I don't know what the statistics are for drug addiction, but let me tell you this. Here's a very interesting uh, part of, of my ministry, what I've learned. And I'm going to use only the places that I can talk about by name. So when I talk about by name, I usually talk about something in Lexington, because I have the permission to speak. I don't have permission to speak about other places. When I began the two support groups for LGBTQ uh, students at Lexington Catholic, um, we, we called them together for listening sessions first. That's how it all began. And at first we had, I think, seven girls that came. And then we ended up, I think, with 11 or 13. And we got around the table talking and listening to them just about listening to them. Every one of them, every single one of them, were on anti-anxiety medications. And we're listening to them. Why? Because of who they were and what they felt they were hearing from the church. None of them were going to church anymore. 
Some are going to pretty good churches in the Lexington area, but they weren't going. Wonder where the boys were. Figure there had to be at least one gay boy in a school that big, not more. They were so afraid to even come out and admit who they were for fear of being found out. Find out when they started coming, they too were on anti-anxiety medications. I find this repeated all over. So I don't know about abuse, but I do know about the need to self-medicate just to be able to cope. And it's huge. And we have to wonder why. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong in our Catholic communities that are forcing kids not to want to come here to hear the good news, to work on personal conversion, to be part of a community that supports them or should be supporting them, but are sitting there terrified of who they are and people are going to find out because they're hearing messaging. One guy, I'll tell you about, uh, I'm going well, I, again, I could talk forever, so cut me off with that microphone if you need to. One guy, JT, I could tell his story too. JT came back to the church at St. Paul's. Um, he made his confirmation 30 years prior. Kids have to go to confession before the confirmation, or had to then. I guess they still do. And he went to the then pastor at St. Paul, which was his parish, and he told his pastor 30 years ago, the night before confirmation, that he was gay or homosexual, I think is the word he used at that time, a long time ago. You know what the pastor told him? Well, you better think of somewhere else to spend your Sunday morning so you're not welcome here. If you want to hear from JT, there's articles about it. I'll bring him here next to talk. Take a look at his face when he talks about that. JT watched the Catholic community at St. Paul. He watched us go to the Pride festivals and maintain our Catholic presence for a couple of years. Didn't quite buy into it, but watched us. He watched as those banners went up. He watched our bulletin online. He watched us for a couple of years to see what we were doing if we were authentic if we were true, or if this was just some kind of a cruel way to get people in and tell them that they're wrong, or they're sick, or that they don't belong there, or that they need conversion therapy, or that they need to stop doing what they're probably not even doing anyway. So after he watched us for a long time, JT came back. JT now serves on the parish council. We renovated our Ave Maria building, which is our parish hall, largely without a huge bill because JT is an architect and did that, brought that back to the church. JT now comes to Mass every single Sunday as a member of LGBT ministry. We have brought people back to the church that were baptized, that wanted to be part of the Catholic community because see how those Christians love one another. Wow, gay people. wanting to be baptized, it, it, it almost sounds like a bad joke because they're fleeing from the church, not coming in. But it goes to show when you are trying to be authentic, you're trying to be the community of the way, much like Jesus had in mind, I think, that it becomes attractive. And, and the Pope keeps telling us that we're going to grow the church by attraction. He's right. Jesus was right. Didn't he say something similar? They'll know you're They'll know you're my followers, the love you have for one another. And it works. Such a simple recipe for miracles. I don't know why I told you that when you asked about drugs, but I thought that's another story of somebody coming back that could have ended up on drugs. You know? The biggest addiction, I think, that I, that I worry about is the addiction to the fear of being themselves. And JT was, what, 50-something when he came back. Or 50-whatever. Uh, that just, I mean, it would break your heart to think somebody's sitting there for 30 years feeling that they should be someplace else on a Sunday morning. And yet this person has so much to give to the Catholic community, so much to give to the church. And we're telling them that just by virtue of who they are. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. I uh, 
I had an experience at one point walking in my cassock, and these three guys who were dressed rather effeminate kind of called out. They said, nice dress, man. And uh, they, they clearly just kind of wanted to mock me and keep on going, but Father Zabo never leaves an opportunity to go and, like, meet someone. And so I went up to them, and I just introduced myself, and I said, hey, uh, I'm Father Zabo. And, and we, we talked, and very quickly in the conversation, they said, like, you hate us. And I told them, no, I don't hate you. Like, why would I hate you? And they, they said, well, we're gay. And I went on, like, a lot of what you've been saying, that, you know, we don't hate anyone, like, based on what your attraction is or whatever. Like, there's nothing sinful about being attracted to someone of the same sex. And, like, that's, that's not a problem. But then we went on and talked more about actions. And, uh, and I, I told them, like, that's, that's where disagreement is. Now, I'm, I'd like to clarify, like, you could help me understand more about this. Um, it, are same-sex acts, in some cases authentic expressions of love. I wasn't really clear on the last part of the talk there. Sure. Could you clarify that? And if so, especially in my position, could you help me understand how that could be, if so? Sure. First of all, I, if somebody came to me with that question, I would say to them, go speak to your spiritual director, your pastor, or your confessor. I'm not in a position to answer those questions. I'm not in a position to say anything about someone's intimate life. I know what the church teaches. The church teaches that all sexual acts outside of marriage, taboo, uh-uh, no, don't do it. Now, we know that our young people, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, are hooking up. We know that people in our parishes are getting it on with their secretary, getting it on with a neighbor, and not with their wife. We know all kinds of things. I mean, it's just the reality, the basic reality of life. I mean, we've got a city parish. If we questioned everybody at the communion rail, we'd have a problem. Uh, the communion would take far too long for the verses that the music minister has in mind. So to answer your question, and to answer it honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in a position to know the answer to that. I'm in a position to say that some people may say that, but that's for someone to figure out between them and their confessor. This is what the church teaches. The church teaches that all sexual acts outside of marriage are sinful, are wrong, are taboo, are not kosher. Correct? So, and they also have to be open, if you're heterosexual, to life. Correct? So if I'm seeing a young couple in the pew, and they don't have any kids, and I'm guessing what's going on there. Uh, they all look very it's fertile Myrtle and her husband, and they just don't have a whole bunch of kids. Am I to presume something? No. Same way I don't presume it with the gate, but I tell them the truth. This is what the church teaches. We've got to tell the truth, the hard truth, and I'm happy to do that. Now, somebody can argue with me, too, and say, well, you know, this is an expression of my love. This is an expression of whatever things that I said. It's life-giving. It's, it's whatever. Am I in the position to contradict the church? No. Am I, in a, am I in the position to say to a person that says that to me, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual, go see your confessor. Go see your spiritual director. Yes. And that's exactly what I do. And trust that men like you, in your positions, will pastorally accompany those people in the internal forum and things that are just too big for me. But we've got to tell them the truth. But I don't I, I make the distinction that I, that I hope I was making. As I said, I could talk for a week. And, and I was we're scratching the thing. But we're not starting from that. I mean, you didn't go to those guys and, and look at them like they're doing something wrong. And they you know, owe you an apology for their behavior towards you. That's just incredibly rude. If you go up to someone in a burqa and, and just being rude. I mean, expression of faith and expression of faith, whatever we wear. But by the same token, I don't think you approached those guys, did you, with the, with the presumption? The, right. So I guess without knowing what their position was, or if they came to me and asked that question, I'd send them to you. Well, that's what you're here for. So that's what you signed up for. <laughs> I mean, 
But, I mean, do you have a different way that, that you think that I should approach that? I mean, we tell the truth. We tell what the church teaches. We articulate what we're hearing, you know, from a community or from people, what I hear. We, we, we say that out loud. But the bottom line is that I can't be everywhere and in all places. So you tell the truth. You say what the church teaches. And then you say, take it up with your priest. Because that's what they're there for. And you hope to Almighty God that the priest has a heart like Jesus' heart. So they're not going to jump down their throats and kill him anymore. It's going to kill the kid that's coming in and saying, well, I masturbate every week on Saturday nights because I look at porn. Or I drink too much every Thursday night because my dad beats the hell out of my mom. I mean, what are all the circumstances surrounding something? And then, and then what, what kind of discussions do we have with people? So again, if we scratch the surface with a lot of these things. But there's so many layers to this. And the best way is to seek pastoral accompaniment. And that's y'all. Is that right? You're welcome. First, thank you for talking. So I'm a little confused. So the LGBTQ ministry we have is a ministry to welcome It's a, it's a ministry to welcome, to affirm them in their baptismal dignity. Okay, when you say baptismal dignity, I want to make sure I understand. Sure. Our baptismal dignity is, is the dignity that we each have as a child of God, right? And sometimes that dignity gets eroded. For a long time, divorced people felt like second-class citizens in this church. Their baptismal dignity was eroded because they were divorced. Correct? I, I know that by just speaking to people that were divorced. Um, and not everybody was divorced because they wanted to trade in their wife or husband for a younger model. Some people were divorced because they got the daylights beat out of them. And they certainly, does God want people to stay in those kind of marriages again, leading up to these guys and that man there? Talk about that in some pastoral counseling sessions, and you might find out. But their dignity was eroded within the church. Well, I, I understand where you're coming from. Sure. Where you're coming from. And I don't think any Christian would, any true Christian would treat a person based on what they think or what, how they're acting or that. But the problem that I'm having is, because I don't hear this in what you're saying, Is homosexuality a sin? Being homosexual is not a sin. But is homosexuality? What do you mean by is homosexual? You have to define what you mean by that. I am a homosexual. I am not a sin. Okay. You're a homosexual. If you act out on your homosexuality, Correct. is that a sin? If I act out on it in what way? Sexually? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. I believe it could be a sin. Yes. Is it always a sin? One has to be culpable for sin. Is that not true? There has to be a culpability. Well, you said, okay, you talked about masturbation and Correct. you talked about uh, contraception. Okay, mm -hmm. you're right. People don't go around saying, hey, I'm on my birth control or hey, I'm, right. you know, fine. But let's just say that in a church, Of their a lot of his parishioners were using contraception. Mm -hmm. Would it not be incumbent on that pastor to minister to those people and say, you know, biblically, this is not correct, or what you think about this church is not correct? Well, or are you, are you going to make a ministry saying, okay, everybody that has is using contraception, we're going to have this ministry so that we can welcome them? But I think if they felt, like the divorced, if they felt that they were, everybody who was using contraception felt that they were on the margins and outside of the church, they'd say, heck yeah, get a ministry together, bring those people home. Absolutely. Okay, Without a doubt. Because you want to pull people in so that they can hear the word of God. Correct. We want to restore their baptismal dignity. And that baptismal dignity stops us all from, no matter who we are, it stops us all from acting out in ways that are undignified. It brings us 
to that personal conversion. So if you're asking about about sex, I think that's what you're getting to. You want to know what somebody's doing with their genitals. Is that what you're no, getting to? Not necessarily, no. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to find out where you're going right, with what this. What I'm trying to say is, in the Bible, from, from what I've studied, sexual, there's sexual immorality in the Bible. If, whether it's between two heterosexuals or between two homosexuals, it's wrong. So I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I don't want to judge somebody you know, and make them feel undignified. It's not my place to condemn anybody. However, I do have a plumb line that is God. So, so then you're, you're presuming, I, what I'm hearing though, is that you're presuming that the ministry is an affirmation of sin. That's what I'm hearing you say to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, is an affirmation of a sinful lifestyle. Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. What I'm is I guess I'm not hearing what you're. No. And, and maybe, Walt, if you can help me understand what, what I'm hearing here, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not hearing properly. I mean, I, from what I have uh, heard you say, yeah. and your ministry is so welcoming, you know, to me, the church is for sinners. The church isn't for people that are righteous. First of all, first of all none of us are righteous. All right. We're all sinners, sure. whether, it's heter whether it's homosexuality or uh, somebody that steals or somebody that continually lies. We're all sinners. First, it's for the but being homosexual is not a sin. I was going to say that. So, so then that's what you're saying. That's what I wanted to know. Right. Correct. Why? Okay, well, let's let's how, take this in a different so, room. Let me ask you this. How, how do you know that if somebody is an enemy of the church, is it is it you, you, your desire to want to kill them? To what? It makes you want to kill them. How do you tell me? Well, we don't know that. Well, okay, so then why are all of the Christians in the Bible sinners? Well, yeah, because there are, there are I think you have to follow the science, too. Yeah. Well, right. But stealing, but so you're, so you're going to tell me that a person that is born with a propensity to sin that sin is an offense. It, is that person culpable? That's the We're question. No, that's not true. We're not all culpable. If you, if you, if there's no culpability, then you've got a whole different discussion. Well, you probably could speak to that a little bit more as a confessor. Am I wrong in saying that? I think a part of that is. Um, where the church teaches also about conscience. Um, you know, this whole business of culpability, you know, is that person, um, you know, truly the very core of their being? Are they truly, do they know that that is, you know, uh, a sinful thing like stealing or what have you? Um, I think, well, culpability, yeah, but also, you know, with, 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 with conscience, you know, the church teaches conscience, but for so long, and I, I would say up until this very day, if you will, you know, we teach conscience, but the church is going to tell you what your conscience tells to, says to you, you know, uh, rather than, well, you know, my conscience in my own, in, in my prayer, in my, um, you know, uh, in my dealings with other people, with my reading of scripture, you know, this is, you know, my conscience is clear, you know. We teach it, but we don't follow it, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Like, we, we teach conscience, okay? Um, so if you are going to look and say something about, like, stealing, all right? So you say, well, you know, my conscience says I do not steal. Or... Um, or it says, well, yeah, I think there's no problem with that. You know? uh, but it, it, it's this culpability. Are, are, are you truly in your mind and heart? Are, are you, it's just like with mortal sin, okay? This whole thing of mortal sin. And I really do think in some ways, you know, I, I think we're sort of equating person and sin. 
in this in in you know in, in the in the dialogue. Okay, um, and, and I think that you know you know we have to kind of you have to sort of like not I can't say you can't you know, not, but we have to look at the person mm -hmm. first, dignity of the human person. Um, But who's presuming, I want to know, I'd like to know who's presuming the sin in this regard, except the person that is sinning. If I am sinning, but, but, but who are we judging? Well, yes, Bible, but also her own tradition. Tradition? Tradition. Right. So from the Bible, the tradition, that's where we get our teachings. Mm -hmm. So we can't separate, we can't separate those, you know, it, it's, it's a combination of all of that. You know, so is a person who is, in a sense, if there's a person who, like, say, murders, is that person culpable? I don't know. You know, was there mental illness? Was there, um, were they forced? Uh, you know, different, you know, the, so, so the culpability We're talking about the context, though, of, of the human person. When we talk about when we talk about the uh, the primacy of, of conscience, for example, it's a well-informed conscience. So we have to be well-informed. Um, let's go back to Nick. My story about Nick. He had to be well-informed in order to make decisions that were aiding his dignity. Does that make sense to y'all? Okay. So maybe before that he didn't have all of the tools that were necessary to make those decisions. But I don't think it's fair, I know it's not fair, it probably is almost sinful on our part, to look at a person and just say that because of who a person is that we are judging them for being walking, talking sin, and therefore we have a ministry that is affirming sin. Uh, I, I, I don't think that that, you can't make, you can't be it's like going from zero to 95 without ever hitting every number in between on that dial. That just, it's, it's just, uh, it, for lack of a better word, it makes no sense. Go ahead. So this com comment comes from a priest, not in this diocese, even in this state. I was listening to something, a talk a few months ago, and hadn't thought it through till he said it. And he talked about how the Catholic Church will not bless gay marriage. And I think that's where I don't agree with that. But, um, but that is where people get stuck of you know, having sex outside of marriage. The Catholic Church won't bless that marriage. And I think that's where people get stuck in their head with that being there. Um, but I just want to just like make that comment that I think that that's something that needs to change. I mean, there's so many wonderful relationships mm -hmm. that have so much to offer to the church and to their communities. Um, and I understand what he gave one of the reasons why the church wouldn't, because you, know, you couldn't have children. But, but we marry people in their 70s that can't have children. We marry well, infertile and, and, people. And the, the person who kind of argued with him a little bit says, well, what if they want to adopt and right. bring you know, tons of children who need homes? And, and but he was adamant on that. And think that's where people sure I think there's I think right I think right now since you bring that topic up I think one of the best places to look for the discussion of this topic about blessing unions or the idea of the church looking at witnessing and blessing gay marriage is our German bishops just do a Google search they're far more eloquent than I could ever hope to be and I'm learning from them and hopefully the church is learning from them at least in dialogue I don't, I don't know where the answer is or where it is. And I think one thing that's not helpful is that we call the civil contract and the sacrament the same thing. I think that is so unhelpful. The Pope has said himself that he is for civil unions, meaning for people to have civil rights that are same-sex uh, unions. Okay, look that up. I think he's on record saying that during a couple of uh, in-flight press conferences. So a civil union is a contract. 
It's a contract that's entered into by the state, correct, by two people. Can we bless a civil union? That's what the German bishops are asking right now. Should we be? As a matter of fact, now, they're not saying should we. They are doing it, and their priests are doing it. Now, this is how change has always occurred in the church. You know, so maybe we're witnessing the evolution of doctrine. Maybe we're witnessing change. I, I don't know. But I say look there for the answers to that. Look to those German bishops and see what they're saying and see how those conversations are going. I think it's unhelpful when we say gay marriage. The church loves Muslim people, and the church loves Jews, and the church loves Protestant people. But none of them, two of them, are going to march up to this altar and have Walt witness their marriage. Now, if they went out and got themselves a civil union at the JP, marched in and said, Walt, you know, you're a good friend, you're a wonderful witness in this community. You know, we love Catholics. Would you offer us a blessing? You'd have to be nuts not to tell two Muslims or two Jews or two Protestants, no, I'm not going to bless you. So two gay people come up to you, and they say to you, can you offer us a blessing? Should we say no? We bless them. Of course we bless them. I don't think the church is going to change a sacrament. Do you guys think that's going to happen? <laughs> I mean, nobody's asking me my opinion in Rome, that's for sure. And I wouldn't even know what kind of an opinion to give them. I don't, I don't know what to say at this point. But I know that people should be able to come to their pastors and receive the church's blessing. And I know that people who don't believe everything that we believe should be able to come to our church's pastors and ask for and receive God's blessing, a prayer of blessing upon them. Go ahead. So um, as someone who has been a part of this community for nearly 30 years and also partnered in a same-sex relationship for 30 years, having been married through a civil union, that was... We could, not have the church, we could not have the wedding in this church, but the pastor at that time said, you can have your reception in the hall, and I will bless your marriage when you get here. And it was so affirming, because I think you made a really important distinction in your talk, and that is about the difference between chaste and not chaste. When you come to someone, and you are pure of heart and compassionate, and you are honoring the dignity of the other person in the relationship, that needs to be celebrated. And so I think as a church, we need to celebrate that, regardless if it's same-sex, bisexual, homosexual. You know, we should honor the dignity of the people who are involved in the relationship. Now, to change the dialogue a little bit, <clears throat> as someone who grew up in this community and went to high school here in a Catholic high school, I had a friend who came out in our junior year and was told by the principal and her parents that she needed to leave the school. So for all the other gay kids, and there were many of us, all silent, um, it, it drove that silence deep into our hearts. Thankfully, I went to a Jesuit school where I said to a priest in my freshman year as a 19-year-old, I don't know if I can be a part of this church anymore because of X, Y, and Z. And he said to me, you can be a part of the church. It's part of who you are. You can work to change the church from the inside. If you leave the church, does that change who you are? In your soul, do you know you are? And I said, no. He said, then stay in the church. Stay in the church and fight for change. And that's why I stand here before you, fighting for change, having raised two children in this church, being married 30 years in two weeks. Sure. Congratulations. God bless you. You know, just to piggyback off, off, of, off, of, off of your personal story, you know, at St. Paul, we see people all the time because we are sort of the mecca now for the LGBT community as far as Louisville and even, even further, an hour or two or three in, in other places. One of the most edifying things that I see, to be honest with you, is the generosity of LGBT couples who bring their kids for baptism, who are not only welcoming a child into their 
love for one another. Are you a little weepy here? Sorry. But who oftentimes take children that no one else wants to take. Now, if that's not beautiful, and if that's not a witness to chaste love, then I don't know what else we should be looking for. You know, there are, there are, there are days and then there are days. And when I see those kind of, those kind of things, I think to myself, you know, there's, there's, there's Catholic heroism at its finest because we're feeding them a plate of garbage and they're still coming and they're still loving and they're loving enough to love a child in the, in the adoption line that is so darn hard to place. You know, two guys in Lexington have been fostering the toughest kids you can imagine. I would have a complete mental breakdown. I'm not called to that. But those two in their relationship are called to that. And what a blessing they are. Because I know another couple in Lexington who have been together for a number of years. Um, and I'll say his name. His name is Craig and his husband. And they took two boys on years ago. These boys were beaten and malnutrition, uh, what was it, mal, mal, malnourished. I can't even talk anymore. Um, and these boys have flourished. They've just flourished. I tell Craig all the time, thank you for your witness. Thank you for, for your heroic brand of love that teaches us all something in Lexington and beyond. That doesn't deserve a blessing. I promise you, I don't deserve a blessing. I think so, I need to bring Mike. I believe that there's uh, too much emphasis on the Old Testament and not enough on the New Testament, which, are, which Christ gave us. The Old Testament has says all these things that what's bad and what's a sin. The New Testament, uh, uh, I believe that when Christ came, he, 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 he said he, he said he, he fulfilled the law, and he said, "Oh, oh, 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 oh!" His law is, is love one another as I have loved you, and people will know you're my friends. And, and some people who are insist in, 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 are taking too much in the Old Testament. So many uh, uh, trans people are being murdered because of, of a particular uh, a particular thing in Deuteronomy that says if a man wears a, a woman's clothes, it's a, it's a, it's a sin and an, an abomination. So the, the, these people who believe they're good Christians, they go ahead and kill somebody and think they're doing God's work. Sure. And people are getting into that. Sure. Every year, hundreds of people are going that way. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean... Anybody eat shrimp? You got to die tonight. The Old Testament says you got to die because you're eating shrimp. I mean, so if we look at those kind of things, we can take it to the bazaar. But the, but the reality here is true. Our trans community is getting the daylight speed out of them, are being un, unfairly uh, manipulated to death, and being denied their dignity. You know, I'll never understand the trans experience. I'll never understand it. I admit to you I'll never understand it. But that doesn't mean that I can't embrace it. I can't love the person. I can't try to hear their story. I can't try to enter into the story. I can't try to accompany that person. I can't try to be Jesus for that person, but the person be Jesus for me, too. Otherwise, I failed miserably as a Christian because I have judged and I have aided in destroying the body of Christ. Because I tell you, one day, I don't know if we all think we know everything right now, but I long for that day when we will know all things in the one that knows all things. And I'd hate to be standing on the wrong side. Some of you say, well, I'd hate to stand on the wrong side too and not call out sin. Well, I hate to be standing on the wrong side and not love enough like Jesus told me to love. 
So which side do you want to be standing on on that day, I guess? I've been a member of this church for, for about 45 years. And people who knew me then and know me now see two different people. I am one of the trans people. I had such a slow change that, that people, I don't know, but a lot of people just simply accepted it's what I am. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I, know, I remember the first time that uh, I started looking a little lit, and I had some, somebody walk up to me and say, mm, do you have another name you'd like to go by? And I was just accepted. I've had people outside that way, and, and so I'm, I'm here. Father Ken, you know, he used to accept me. And uh, he, he was one who, 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 who officiated my marriage when my wife and I first got married. Of course, uh, 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 after she died and everyone else had moved away, and that's, I kind of, after being a cross-dresser for years, I just started, I came, I came out when I was about, when I was uh, about to 62, I started taking hormones and started changing. Now I'm 77, and uh, I've never been, uh, I seem to be happy this way. So I mean, and those hormones must have helped because you look terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Well, my, I, I come from a family where, 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 where oh, my father lived to be like 89, and my grandmother lived, lived to be about 95. So. Yeah, praise God. Please, please, and live forever after that. You know, I, I'll tell you a story just real quick. Um, there, there's, a, there's another person that I know that's, that's trans. This person was married. He was married for, uh, I think, like 40 years to his wife, a female, uh, and loved his wife incredibly. And soon after their marriage, he leveled with her, said he never felt like a man on the inside. He never felt like a man. He knew something was, was odd about his body and about who he thought he was. But he so loved his wife that he would go to work, present as a man. He would come home. His wife so loved him that he would cross-dress at home just to feel like he would feel comfortable. Like we might just put on, I don't know, take off your cassock and put on your, your running clothes or, or whatever to lounge around in the evening, just to feel comfortable. His wife died eventually of cancer. And he was there for his wife as him. And then began the transition. My God, isn't that heroic love that we can learn from some? Talk about self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice on both of their behalfs. They loved one another as they were. They found out a way to be able to love and to be as they were. And only after that heroic love of husband and wife had run its natural course through death did this man begin to explore and to make the change, and then became a very vocal, but beautifully loving vocal advocate for trans persons. I don't know about you, but I find that heroic. It's like people that take care of their parents and forsake marriage sometimes because they feel the call to do that. Or maybe it's like these guys that have forsaken. I don't know if these guys are straight or gay. I don't know what they are, these priests that are in this building. But whatever they are, they gave it up in a real heroic way to serve the people of God. There's a lot of heroism around us, an awful lot. And a lot of it's in the LGBTQ community, too. Anybody else? Yes. Perfectly, it's just that um, as the true church, we must remember the reason why we come to church is the fact that we seek Christ. You know, there's no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no woman, no man. You know, we are all one in Christ. And I think if we keep our heart centered on Christ alone, he does the work in our hearts. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the conversion that I spoke about, that constant conversion that we're all called to, to have our hearts become just like the heart of Jesus. Go ahead. First of all, thank you again for your talk. Um, Father and I were actually we're campus ministers at West Virginia University, so we deal with conversations like this a lot. You know, college students they're searching for meaning, searching to find find themselves. 
Um, I, have, I have two questions that are unrelated, but just to clarify, what you, I, thought, I felt like we were missing each other, we were going back to really understand each other earlier from your conversation. I also, I also want to say, whenever we're in a conversation like this, when it's quote unquote controversial, it's really hard to speak what, you're, what you say, you know, because of the quote unquote other side. Make it, so I want to um, commend uh, anyone who, yeah, who's speaking up first off your, your thoughts, because um, it's very hard because a nat, uh, an emotional response um, wants to jump on that. So I, wanna, I want to uh, applaud that. Um, culpability, right? So culpability, yeah, whether or not we ourselves are response, are going to be held accountable for our sin, yeah, it depends on the circumstance. Um, the catechism uh, says that uh, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. So contrary to the natural law, they close the sexual act to the gift of life. Uh, they don't proceed from a genuine effective and sexual complementary. Under no circumstances can they be approved. So what that means in simple speech is that they are always gravely wrong, but whether or not an individual is culpable for them depends on the situation. So we can never approve of something that is gravely wrong. Whether or not they will be held accountable, uh, it depends on the circumstance, right? It depends on their knowledge, all these things. So that's what that, just to clarify that. Um, now, my question, which is unrelated, uh, so how would you describe um, your ministry, the, how is it different from Courage Apostolate? Um, for those who don't know, Courage Apostolate is the, I guess the quote-unquote quote official apostolate of the church um, for those with same-sex attraction. So where is your similar, where is yours different from Courage? Sure, I, th I think our starting points are very different than Courage. I think Courage, and I'm glad you asked that question. Because people say, how do you feel about Courage? How do I feel about Courage? As though Courage cares what I feel about, or anybody else cares what I feel about. But if a person is struggling with chastity, for example, that's above my pay grade. It's above the pay grade of elder. We have a courage chapter in Lexington. That is what courage deals with. That is basically what courage deals with in my knowledge of, of courage. So I would have no hesitancy to say, try that out, speak to your, again, speak to your pastor, your confessor, your spiritual director, or check out courage. Ours, change, ours is different from that because ours seeks to bring people just back into the church to go out to allow them to know that they are welcome in the church because so many people do not feel welcome in the church. To my knowledge, Courage is not doing that. I've not seen that anywhere in this country where Courage is doing that actively in parishes. Intentional LGBT outreach, which is exactly what we do in the Diocese of Lexington, the Outreach Commission, is a diocesan, part of the diocesan structure which actively seeks to bring back, to restore the rapport, to restore the relationship between those that are on the margins and those that are feeling outcast, the JTs, the Nicks, the rest of them, that whoever else, whatever other names we have for these people, to bring them back in, to make them part of the community. And I don't use that term lightly to restore the baptismal dignity, to, to let them know, to hear the gospel, to bring them to the sacraments, to allow you guys to do what you guys are supposed to do, but to bring them back home. That's where we differ. I don't see courage doing that. And if I'm wrong, I'd like to see it where, where, where it happens, where that happens. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then I just have a thought, just theologically about that, you know, with, in regards to losing our baptismal dignity. I don't think we can do that even by sinning. Because we can feel, we can feel. feel. Say, that's a feeling, it's correct. correct. Not, we don't lose our baptism. Correct. Um, then my second question, which is unrelated, but, uh, you know, as a, I guess, minister, and um, I, I, I work with people with same-sex attraction. Um, it's a joy um, uh, to see them striving after Christ. I've had a parent drive two hours across the state um, to speak to me because they were struggling with the fact that they, they loved their child, um, but their child was acting out 
homosexual actions. And they loved their child. They didn't kick the child out of the house or anything like that. Um, and they went to their priest about it, and the priest told them to um, approve of their homosexual acts, uh, of the child's act, homosexual acts. And the person, in their conscience, well-formed by the teachings of the church, and loved their child, could not do this. And so they traveled, like I said, two hours uh, to speak to me about it. I've had um, people with same-sex attraction come, and they're, they're offended um, by those in the church who are not calling them on to live, to not engage in uh, homosexual acts um, because they see as a front to their dignity as human persons. Um, because they see that, that we have to be 100% a, a person's homosexual orientation. Um, you know, God, if God has allowed it, it's part of his plan. Right? How, could you, how could you argue with that logically, right? And so that in and of itself is not sinful, but the actions are. So they're offended when those in the church uh, seem to point to promoting homosexual activity um, because it goes against how they're living. They're living chastely. They're living, they're not engaged, they're choosing not to engage, they're choosing to be faithful to Christ. Um, so they, they're, how do we deal with that? when we have very unclear situations going on in the church today. Um, because as we see from this room, there's a lot of un unclarity. Um, how can we speak to those who are on the peripheries, to use that language, to accompany them um, when they feel that they are not being accompanied and supported by their own church? Meaning like the mother? No, no, no. Um, meaning I, I like, understand you. Like, the, like the pastor who says that it's, they should support um, homosexual activity, um, like those in the church who uh, seem to only focus on affirming the orientation and are not being clear about uh, the intrinsic nature of the homosexual acts, not the culpability. Right. Well, I think the church is very clear, as you have stated, um, regarding what the church teaches. Correct? I mean, the church is clear about that, just like the church is clear about abortion. It's very, very clear. Is that? Well, on yes, on book, but not not in lived experience. As in like there, some will say, some, some priests will say it's okay, some will say no. Some will say it's okay to, li to live. Well, I, can't, I can't answer for those, for those priests that do that, I certainly can't. But what I can say, I think, and what I think the reality is, is number one, I wonder why we feel the need to hammer home for the LGBT community this idea of, of no sex, no sex, no sex, no sex. If we tried that with our straight youth, if we tried that with our college students over and over and over and presume that they are all messing around, I, I, I think they'd find that offensive. I think our married people would find it offensive if we were looking around saying, you don't have enough kids sitting with you in the pew. Are you using birth control? I mean, where do you draw the line with looking at people and saying that I got to hammer this point home because I feel that maybe you're not living up to your end of this, this church membership bargain, or you're not living up to being uh, part of the body of Christ as you should be. Somehow or another, I think that's a, that's, there's something wrong with, with that kind of a, of a thing. So I guess the question by itself, it begs the question, why does somebody feel the need to do that? I mean, I can't imagine, I, I don't preach, so I don't know. I mean, I don't preach and I don't hear confession, so I'm at a loss. I can only tell you what I do and what I bring in, and then I, then I count on priests to do the rest of the stuff. So if you're doing your jobs right, well, then you're doing your jobs right. Um, but by the same token, I can't imagine any church member that would not be offended with the presumption that no matter what sin we were preaching, you were, you were looking at them and thinking, well, you've got nice glasses. I know you're only making 22000 a year, and you've got a nice car out there. You stealing? I mean... Where do we draw the line with that kind of a stuff? Does that make sense? So to be preaching about that to the gay community over and over and over is just absolutely offensive because it's presuming something that's not happening. Now, a parent that comes and knows their kid's screwing around doesn't want the kids, I don't care if it's heterosexual or homosexual, in the house. That's a parent. My parents would draw the line. They'd say, here's where we're going. I don't care if you're bringing a girl home. I don't care if you're bringing a guy home. I don't care what it is. Not in this house. You know, did you ever have that? said to you when you're growing up. So yeah, I get it. But by the same token, I, I don't get where we constantly look at people and, uh, and assume 
that we need to lecture them about sin that may not be occurring. Oh, yep. No, I agree with you. What you're saying, um, we shouldn't assume that we should never assume. There's that that saying where you can never assume. Um, but as priests, I think we have to call on everyone, not just not focus on one person. But yeah, focus on uh, the the body of Christ, the people. Absolutely, I agree with you. Thank you very much for being. You all exhausted? This is, you know, this is not an easy topic, but it's not easy being church. It's not easy being human. It's not easy following the gospel. And it's, it's especially not easy when the Spirit's involved, because the Spirit always creates fire. And so we had some fire in this room, and that's terrific. I think the important thing is, what do we do to be the best body of Christ that we can be? So my advice to you all, stay close to our Blessed Mother. She'll always lead us to Jesus. We just pray that our hearts will be like Jesus and we'll never go wrong. Thanks, folks.